Well, what everyone seems to agree upon, except the Russians, of course, is that Ukraine has managed to fight the Russian ground advance to a halt almost everywhere. And in some places, Ukrainian forces are regaining territory. One of the reasons this Russian failure has so surprised observers and experts is that many people assumed that Russia had learned from its previous botched military operations, because Russia has been in this situation before less than 30 years ago, when President Boris Yeltsin sent a column of tanks into neighboring Chechnya. The aim was to quickly take Chechnya's capital and put down its bid for independence, but it did not go as planned. Tonight, Yeltsin is in serious trouble at home and abroad as a result of his clumsy and so far disastrous invasion of the breakaway Republic of Chechnya. NBC's Tom Aspel tonight is in the little mountainous province that will not die. Hundreds of Chechen rebels today headed towards the center of Grozny to see what was left of a Russian armored column wiped out trying to capture their presidential palace. The Russians made the tactical mistake of sending in their fighting vehicles without infantry support. Chechen defenders picked them off from rooftops and street corners. When the three-day battle was over, burned out vehicles and bodies were scattered in Freedom Square. The Chechens celebrated their victory against the mighty Russian army with a traditional war dance. There is no place more symbolic or more important for the Chechens than their presidential palace. If the Russians do get reinforcements, they'll probably try to take it again. They'll need crack troops, not conscripts, who are seeing battle for the first time. Nikolai Sergeyev, 19 years old, was sent from more than a thousand miles away. He'd never heard of Grozny before his 200-man company reached the city railway station in the middle of a battle. He's one of only three survivors. The Chechens blew us to bits, he said. We talk now about how much smaller Ukraine is than Russia, but Chechnya was tiny. Ukraine has over 40 million people. Chechnya had just over one million, and yet they managed to stop a tank column and wipe out an entire brigade of one of the world's most powerful armies. The longtime New York Times foreign correspondent Carlotta Gall was, at, was in Grozny at the time. She says there was, quote, a stunned silence in Russia in the days that followed as the leadership took stock of what had happened in the army, and the army sent in reinforcements. She describes what happened next, quote, the Russian army unleashed a terrifying onslaught of air and artillery strikes on the city. A modern European city became a ravaged moonscape. I remember how buildings were shorn in half and the contents of people's lives spilled out of their apartments into the open air. After three months, Russian forces took the city center and soldiers sat on plastic chairs guarding a wasteland of destroyed buildings, gouged earth and stricken tree stumps. Now, after leveling the place, Russia signed a peace deal with Chechnya, but Russia didn't seem to have gotten much out of the whole deal besides widespread destruction and tens of thousands of deaths. The peace deal even seemed to tacitly acknowledge Chechnya's independence. But then Boris Yeltsin tapped Vladimir Putin to be Russia's prime minister. And Putin decided he was going to finish the job. The people here are still dazed. The surprise attack tore through the central food market. The sudden brutal rain of rockets and shrapnel was totally unexpected. This home video taken moments after the attack here in the heart of Chechnya. And nearby, witnesses say four missiles exploded overhead. U.S. officials say they were scuds. Within minutes, the dead were everywhere. The Chechens claim 120 died, 400 injured. Today, Moscow says it is not responsible. Prime Minister Putin blamed Chechen rebels. And the war looks like it's escalating. Today, Russia threatening to double its forces in Chechnya to 100,000 strong. The assault began Christmas Day, the Russians using multiple launch missiles causing widespread damage. And now reports they are using fuel air explosives, which literally drop huge balls of fire. Today, Russia's Prime Minister Vladimir Putin reported to President Boris Yeltsin the war plan is on track. The next year, Vladimir Putin became Russia's president, and he kept at it in Chechnya for nine more years. By the time Russian forces left 
For the second time, not only was Chechnya reduced to rubble once again, but Putin had installed his own puppet leader there, who has now ruled Chechnya for over 15 years with notorious cruelty. He currently has Chechen forces fighting for Russia in Ukraine. Now, remember yesterday when Russia's chief negotiator at the peace talks in Istanbul said that Russia would take steps to de-escalate military operations around Ukraine's capital? Well, today, Putin's hand-picked despot who controls Chechnya put out this video in which he says that Russia's negotiator was wrong. Russia will make no concessions. Putin will not stop. And Russian forces will be going into Kiev in a few days. And look, this guy may not know what he's talking about, but he is a reminder that for Vladimir Putin, the lessons of Russia's decade and a half of grinding war in Chechnya may not be to have a better military strategy. The lesson Putin may have taken is that if you reduce a place to rubble, you get to install your most loyal, ruthless henchman to run it, someone who will be your biggest cheerleader in your next invasion. Everyone's suspicion is that Putin may just be using these peace talks to buy time to regroup and launch a new offensive. Despite Russian claims that they would de-escalate around Kiev and Chernihiv, this was Chernihiv this morning, a market building destroyed by Russian strikes overnight, eerily similar to that market attack in Grozny 23 years ago, though thankfully there were no reports of casualties today. While the Ukrainian leader was soliciting more military aid from President Biden, an all-female delegation of Ukrainian members of parliament was in Washington for meetings with U.S. lawmakers like this one with House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. They're in D.C. asking for more sanctions and weaponry like fighter jets to boost Ukraine's defenses. Their very presence is a reminder of what's at stake. Yesterday, as the Ukrainian delegation asked for that desperately needed aid, an air raid siren alert sounded from one of their cell phones. As it blared, one of the Ukrainian lawmakers said, quote, I need you all to hear that. One of those Ukrainian lawmakers, the member of parliament, Yevhenia Kravchuk, joins me now from Washington. Ms. Kravchuk, thank you for making time to be here with us. The last I saw you was on Friday uh, in Warsaw, and you were on your way. Uh, you've been meeting now with those lawmakers you told us about, including the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, what kind of response are you getting? Um, um, you know, um, uh, when I was watching the, this piece of TV, I can't, you know, I, I just need to give this emotion. And uh, there was an eight years old uh, girl drawing a chalk. Well, you know, I, I, I remember my daughter who is eight years old and, you know, and, and she is in Ukraine right now um, waiting for me to come, you know, with some sort of news saying that, you know, America will help us. So that's basically the question that I've been asked from, you know, everyone. Uh, so we do um, send our messages about the weapons, about the sanctions, about the financial support. And we're re really th uh, thankful for, uh, for example, we've got the news that uh, from President Biden saying that uh, they're going to be half a billion of uh, dollars sent uh, to Ukraine, to Ukrainian budget. So uh, we, you know, we see we're getting there. But uh, about weapons is still, you know, we'll be satisfied when we'll have them on the ground. It can't be on the table. Let's talk about the negotiations uh, that, are, that are underway, uh, the ones that have just ended in Istanbul. There's a lot of doubt from the people I'm speaking to inside the country that these negotiations are meaningful and that the, uh, and that the Russian side on this can be trusted. They said they're pulling back from, uh, from Kiev and other places, and that has not turned out to be true. Uh, what's your sense of, of whether these are meaningful negotiations and whether they should, uh, they should continue? First, we do not believe Putin because Putin has done, you know, everything before uh, violating his own words. So what we believe in is our army, Ukrainian army and our soldiers. Um, so we basically think that um, uh, we need uh, a victory on the battlefield and then we can drag all together with civilized world Putin into the table of negotiations because we do need to negotiate, uh, for example, the reparation 
mission to restore Ukraine. Uh, but uh, the winning on the battlefield is essential. So that's why we've been asking for this uh, battle jets, for this air defense system, for artillery, for tanks. You know, uh, there was a big list sent to Pentagon. Um, and we actually asked members of Congress, both from House of Representatives and uh, from the Senate, to, you know, uh, sort of control how this list uh, is going and how we're getting those weapons. One of the things that you said to me in Warsaw that uh, that struck me is that you, like every other Ukrainian I've spoken to, ha has uh, has decided this will end and that Ukraine will sustain itself. And then you you want the world to start talking about what happens next. You actually said to me it's going to need something that looks like a Marshall Plan to rebuild Ukraine. Are you at the point where you can start to have that uh, conversation with people or is it too early right now? Because as you said, Ukraine has to win on the battlefield first. We do start this conversation and also in parallel we're having conversations about international tribunal uh, for Putin and for, you know, all, all of these military uh, generals who've been uh, given the orders to bomb the cities. I mean, that will be uh, a separate track as well. Um, uh, but yes, we, we will need a new Marshall Plan for Ukraine and I'm sure that United States will take a leading uh, role in this. But uh, hey, there are so much much of Russian frozen money around the world from central bank. Uh, you know, we should uh, think about the way how uh, to use the, the uh, to use it to restore Ukraine after the victory. But you know, the first thing what we need, we need to kick out Russians from our country because you know there no can't be any negotiations when uh, somebody puts a gun to your head. Yevhenia Kravchuk, thank you for joining us again. We appreciate that. I understand you are uh, thank you you're, for you're continu me. continuing your travels and your efforts to get the world on your side. Yevhenia Kravchuk is a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Joining us now is Alex Bornyakov. He is the Ukrainian deputy minister of digital transformation. Mr. Bornyakov, thank you for making time to be with us tonight. Hi, everyone. Pleased please to be here. I want to start by asking you some very basic things about this. How have you managed to keep the Internet up and running despite all of the Russian attacks? Well, you know, I think the reason uh, behind this is because in the first place during the they wanted they supposed to and they have this vision to uh, invade Ukraine in three days. So they didn't want to touch any of uh, communication or administrative infrastructure. So this gave us some time to regroup and uh, to defend the critical parts of it. Um, we have a number of services, government uh, authorities that uh, in charge of this. One of them, and the major, it's just like it's called Special uh, Communication Authority that basically take charge for for cybersecurity, defense, and communication inside a country. So after a week or two, they realized they're not going to get. Uh, this so quickly whole Ukraine and they st started to disrupt this infrastructure but we were ready so it, it, right now in the most of the territory of Ukraine excluding war zone of course uh, the communication is stable and cell reception is fine the ministry for which you work the ministry of digital transformation was not actually an uh agency built for war. It's a bureaucratic agency that is now helping modernize Ukraine. How has this transition uh, to becoming a large part of Ukraine's military response been for you? Well, it's because we have to act according to the realities. And uh, yeah, indeed, we, we completely shifted our focus from what we were doing before the war. Um, and uh, right now our focus is digital diplomacy or someone called this digital blockade when we really appeal to hundreds and thousands of companies, mostly like tech companies. Uh, we also uh, take care of, uh, of, of cyber defense of the country and, and, and cyber offense. And, and but we still maintain government services, which you mentioned before. Dia is is a government service that was installed on almost 15 million 
uh, users. Uh, so this app is it's very popular in in Ukraine. So you can get uh, so. But again, there was new features added, like you can get government help with one click in your app uh, if you are from war zone. Um, you mentioned before this uh, app uh, that alert people, and uh, right now we also uh, added a functionality so you can. Uh, make your um, uh, like uh, apply for um, uh, reconstruction of your damaged property and and get uh, help for the government to restore your property which were destroyed by Russian troops. I am amazed at this chat bot that you've developed so that civilians anywhere in the country can report the locations of Russian troops. Help us understand how you're able to confirm those reports and how helpful that tip line has been. Well, it's a great question, though. Uh, the thing is, the DIA, which is which was installed installed on 15 million applications, uh, has a bank AD uh, authorization. So it's it's uh, kind of bulletproof uh, authorization um, made on two factor, and so it's 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 very um, powerful. So we use DIA authorization in this chatbot. So we make sure that there is no. Uh, Russians or uh, like spies or infiltrators. Uh, so uh, DIA uh, being essential part of, of uh, this chatbot uh, on the first uh, on the first pace. Let me ask you about um, the, uh, the speculation at the beginning of this war that Russia would launch a large scale cyber attack uh, against Ukraine and perhaps any anyone who helped Ukraine. That does not seem to have happened. Why do you think that? Well, who said they didn't? They actually did, and they instantly attacking us with a lot of uh, incident. We track a lot of incidents, but it appeared that their cyber offense machine or uh, cyber or cyber offense force is not so powerful as it, it's, it was um, imagined by some experts before the war. So they didn't really penetrate it, uh, penetrate any critical part of our digital infrastructure, but they're trying, they're instantly trying. Let's talk about the recruitment work uh, that your ministry is doing, uh, either crowdsourcing money for Ukraine's military online and, and actually recruiting for the military. So uh, after two days of war, we realized that National Bank of Ukraine severely limited uh, ability of uh, commercial banks and just uh, uh, regular um, peer-to-peer transfers, especially abroad. So we decided to use crypto in order to fundraise. Uh, this is really hectic, but we managed to partner with their uh, private crypto exchange from Ukraine called Kuna. And they help us to establish the security perimeters, all the um, ex- um, exchange uh, mechanisms. So, and we announced that we basically are ready to get donations in the form of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Tether. Um, it, it, and it was beyond our expectations. The community of the world, the crypto world the community, started to donate millions of dollars. So we managed to raise to around seventy million dollars in crypto. And uh, this is this is really what helping our army and was really helpful, especially during the first day of war, where um, uh, payments in dollars and euro were not so available like they available right now. It's a fascinating discussion, and we appreciate you having it with us this evening. Alex Bornyakov is the Ukrainian deputy minister of digital transformation. Mr. Bornyakov, thank you for making time to be with mm-hmm. us tonight. Late last night, three men said goodbye to fellow crew members on the International Space Station and made their way into a tiny Soyuz capsule for their return to Earth 250 miles below. Earlier today, the three men made it safely back to the ground, plopping down in a big puff of dust in the Kazakhstan desert. Inside that capsule were two Russian cosmonauts and one American astronaut, Mark Vandehei. All three men were extracted from the capsule safely, and after some medical testing, they went their separate ways, heading back to their home nations. Images like these of Americans and Russians and Europeans and others working together and depending on each other are how space exploration is supposed to work. 
250 miles above Earth, national boundaries are supposed to disappear along with terrestrial politics. Up there, it's about mutual dependence. But politics did threaten to intervene earlier this month after the U.S. started imposing sanctions on Russia for invading Ukraine. The head of Russia's space agency warned that sanctions against Russia could disrupt their ability to keep the ISS up in orbit and also stop supplying rocket engines to two U.S. aerospace suppliers. And Russia still has not signed on to an ex agreement to extend the life of the space station past 2024. And then there's China, which is building its own space station and is strengthening its ties with Russia in space as well as on Earth. While war rages over terra firma, low Earth orbit is considered neutral territory for now. But watch this space, literally.